This is the ASUS ProArt 27UCGE, and it's a 4K 160Hz monitor designed for creative work. But what kind of creative work is this best suited for? And what makes this monitor particularly interesting? Well, ASUS sponsored this showcase so I can show you everything this monitor has to offer and to see how it performs in a real world scenario, I'm gonna take you guys along and show you my process for taking a photo in one of the most recognizable places in my home city of Vancouver. This video isn't a review, but I hope my experience here gives you a good idea if this is the right monitor for you. Let's get started. When the ProArt 27 UCG arrived, I was excited to try it out because this monitor, unlike any other I have ever used as a daily driver, has a built-in colorimeter. If you do color critical work like photography or color grading and have ever used an external colorimeter, you'll probably understand the problems that come with it. They are kind of annoying to set up, they take up space on your desk if you want them to be accessible, the software experience can be frustrating, and you constantly have to think about recalibrating your display every few weeks. With this built-in color runner, you never have to physically set it up. It takes no space on your desk. You don't technically even need to use any software to do the calibration and you can put it on a schedule of your choosing so your monitor can calibrate itself in your off hours, which means you never have to remember to do it. The schedule can be set on the monitor itself or you can use the ASUS ProArt hardware calibration software to get even more advanced control for tweaking things like the brightness, color gamma, gamma and uniformity composition. If you work in an office and you want multiple of the same display, you can also manage calibration for all of them in a centralized place so you don't have to waste time calibrating each individual monitor in the office separately. Calibration profiles are saved on the monitor so even if you transition from a different computer at any point, your calibration remains intact. If you're anything like me, minimizing the amount of weekly recurring tasks, especially technical ones, is a top priority and I appreciate ASUS offering a time-saving feature like this on a mid-price monitor. Now for the rest of the design, ASUS has stuck with their understated pro aesthetic and if you don't care for RGB lighting or over-the-top looks, you will probably appreciate how this monitor feels on a desk. The stand has smooth height adjustment, a solid amount of tilt, a full 90 degrees of pivot, and a generous 30 degrees of swivel in either direction. There's also a small hole in the stand to help keep your cables tidy. For IO, we have two HDMI 2.1 ports, DisplayPort 1.4, one USB 3.2 Gen 1 with 96 watts of power delivery, one regular USB-C, two USB 3.2 Type A's that also have an auto KVM, with a headphone jack on the corner of the monitor next to the final Type C port. The display itself uses ASUS's Lux Pixel technology, which is essentially their particular version of an anti-glare low reflection coating. They also include a monitor hood in the box just to really make sure nothing interferes with what you see while you work. This panel boasts 4K HDR up to 600 nits peak and sustained brightness with 98% DCI-P3 coverage and 100% sRGB coverage. Because it's 160 Hertz, it's also suitable for playtesting if you work in game development or if you just want to game on it in your off time. If you've ever been annoyed by having to use the unintuitive hardware controls to adjust settings on your monitor, ASUS offers their Display Widget Center, which essentially lets you control everything about the monitor from this relatively simple software. A standout feature of this is the App Tweaker. This allows you to set application-specific color spaces, so the moment you open an application like Adobe Lightroom or DaVinci Resolve, this monitor will automatically change to the color space you set. One less technical thing to remember to do before you actually start working on a project, which is nice. To properly try out editing on the PA27 UCGE, I figured I'd take this opportunity to take a photo in a place I surprisingly had never heard of in my home city of Vancouver, Brockton Point. Something I like to do when I want to practice photography is to find one of the most photographed places in my area and see what happens when I try to shoot in the same place as many others have before me. Now, despite this supposedly being one of the most popular photo spots in Vancouver, in one of the most well-known places in all of BC, Stanley Park, I had never actually heard of Brockton Point before looking it up for this video. I'm not sure if I've just been living under a rock, but it's always nice to shoot somewhere you've never been before. Now I'm going to outline four simple steps I typically take to set myself up for the highest possible chance of coming away with photos I am happy with. Let's start with step number one. What kind of lighting do I want for this photo? When you're shooting outdoors, the time of day you shoot something is one of the most important factors to getting a shot in good lighting. My tool of choice to figure out the ideal time of day to shoot at is Google Earth Pro. It has this awesome feature where you can map the sun throughout the exact day you wanna shoot, which allows you to pinpoint the exact time of day for the lighting that you want, all without leaving your house. 
Typically there is one window of time in the day where the light is ideal for a given location. However, because Brockton Point's main attraction is this lighthouse that was built in 1914, based on the way it faces out towards the ocean, there was actually two windows of time that would put this location in what I would consider good lighting. The first window was at sunrise between 4.30 a.m. and 9 a.m. and the second window was from 6 p.m. to about 8.30 p.m. Both of these times had the sun low in the sky and at an angle that would hit the lighthouse in a pleasing way. I wasn't sure which window I preferred, which brings me nicely to step two, doing a location scout. Since it was easier, I first drove to Brockton Point in the evening to see how things would look. I'm very glad I did this because while the lighthouse does look good in the evening light, and I even got a couple of nice photos of the surrounding area, there was a lot of other people there in the evening and I didn't really want to spend a bunch of time removing people from photos in post. So I settled on coming back on a different day for sunrise in the hopes that it would be less busy. The other huge benefit of doing a location scout is I was able to see some of the challenges of this location from a shooting perspective. Because of the surrounding walkways and bike path, I was actually finding it difficult to get a perspective I was happy with just shooting at eye level or lower. There's always a railing or column that kind of ruined the balance of the test photos. I took a bunch of test shots, not knowing which perspective I like most and planned to review them so I could decide which camera and lens to shoot this on, which is also step three. What camera and what lens fits this location best? Given the geography of this location and the size of this lighthouse, I realized I'd need to be fairly close to it to get an unobstructed shot of it, since I wasn't a fan of how the foreground looked when I was further away. I ended up choosing to shoot at 16 millimeters to really make the lighthouse stand out from its surroundings. To my surprise, the test shots that I liked the most were actually shot on my smallest camera. I recently bought the Canon PowerShot V1, which I also recently reviewed here. I'll probably talk more about why I decided to pick up this camera in a future video. For now, the reason it worked well here was I was able to hoist the camera up high into the air, holding it up with my tripod, which gave me a few perspectives that I actually liked a lot more than anything at eye level. Doing this with a camera any heavier than this would not have been that safe, so this was the perfect tool for the job. On the surface, location scouts might feel inconvenient or time consuming, but you can never be 100% certain what setup might work best in a specific location if you've never been there. If you want to consistently increase your chances of coming away with the shots you imagine in your mind, I highly recommend doing a scout when possible. Which brings me to step four, have fun and stay open to unplanned shot opportunities. Now, I am not a morning person in the slightest, but as much as I hate waking up at 5 a.m. to drive to a location, once I get within five minutes of arriving, when you start to see the light go from pitch black to the cool and warm hues you see with a sunrise, then you step out and take the first few photos, everything leading up to that moment always feels worth it. I forget that I am tired and my mind just locks into getting the shots that I hoped for. Watching the sun slowly come over the mountains is an awesome experience and these are the kinds of moments I personally live for because as much as I like taking photos, getting to have these kinds of experiences outside are why I do this in the first place. It's often awe-inspiring and if you're willing to wake up early, I highly recommend you try this for yourself. As I was driving out of Stanley Park, I also found a second lookout that had a completely different perspective on the lighthouse, so I pulled over and grabbed a few extra shots from there. Unplanned shots are honestly sometimes better than what I plan for, so remaining open to what else is going on besides your main subject is always a good idea. It's kind of like when you go on a great hike, pushing towards the summit, but you turn around once in a while to look back at where you came from, those views can sometimes really surprise you. Before sitting down to try editing on this monitor, I did configure ASUS's widget center so that when I'm editing photos in Lightroom, the monitor would automatically switch to displaying sRGB, and when I'm color grading in DaVinci Resolve, it displays in Rec. 709. Switching does take a few seconds once you open an application, but this feature is going to essentially guarantee you are never in the wrong color space by accident. With that set up, I spent a few hours editing all the photos and videos from Brockton Point. I've personally never been someone who cares that much about a high refresh rate monitor, but I will admit that when the color accuracy can be this impressive while delivering an above average 160 hertz, it does really make the overall experience feel that much more enjoyable. Here are some of my favorite images from doing this shoot at Brockton Point. The real point of a monitor like this is that it gives you the peace of mind that you don't really have to think about the technical details like color accuracy or calibration, and you can focus the majority of your energy on making your work better. 
If you like the idea of never thinking about technical steps like calibrating your monitor every week or worrying about if you are viewing your work in the correct color space, this might be a great monitor to consider for your work. I hope wherever you live, if there is a place in your city that you've never been to, I encourage you to go out and try to photograph it in a way that you've never tried before. If you'd like to learn more about the PA27 UCG and for a limited time get three months free of Adobe Creative Cloud, you can check out the first link in the video description. Thank you so much for spending time with me today.